Joining us from Simon Fraser University's Uwe Glasser. Uwe is a professor of computing science and associate dean of the Faculty of Applied Science at SFU. Dr. Glasser uses compute, com computational logic and discrete mathematics for analyzing, modeling, and reasoning of systems in a wider range of applications. Don't let that description fool you. He's one of the top data authorities in, in the country. And from CSIS is uh, Phil Coton, Director General of Data Management and Exploitation. Uh, Phil leads a team of security practitioners in creating innovative and, and compliant data solutions, national investigations. Phil joined CSIS in 1997 as an intelligence officer and has since been involved in a broad range of national security investigations at the national and uh, regional and global <laughs> perspective. Great to see you, Phil. Thank you very much for participating. I know the audience is very keen to hear from yourself and Dr. Glasher. So without any further ado, I, I believe Dr. Glasher has a presentation that he'll quickly go through to kind of lay the landscape and then Phil, you will follow. So I'll uh, hand, <coughs> excuse me, hand off the uh, microphone to uh, Dr. Glasher. Thank you. Um, okay, so I'm trying to see the slides. So hang on just a second. So I have a problem. I can't see the slides. Is there a way to change this? Oh, yeah. Look at no, it right no, it's now. all good. Thank you very you much. Okay. Um, um, so I, I just, um, and thank you for the opportunity to talk about this. Um, I just give a brief overview of what we are doing um, in, in the work we're doing in my group at uh, the Software Technology Lab in the School of Computing Science at Simon Fraser University. Essentially, all, all the main projects we have uh, focus on predictive analytics using data mining, machine learning, deep learning, anomaly detection methods um, for essentially uh, applications in the wider field of public safety and security. Um, one of the pillars is maritime security, where um, I've been working there in, in close collaboration with uh, MDA, the satellite company, and other um, companies for, for many years. Um, a second uh, newer uh, pillar of, of our work is cybersecurity analytics. And uh, the last one uh, is predictive policing. Um, this is also a field we have been working in for more than 10 years. Uh, we uh, published a book on this in, in uh, 2016, um, shown here at the upper right corner. Uh, let me go just uh, briefly and touch on, on these three things to give you an idea uh, what this is and, and why it's important to have uh, big data and machine learning and uh, AI methods uh, to help with this. Next slide, please. Thank you. So in the maritime domain, um, as is illustrated here, one can see, um, you know, with all the goods that are shipped, there are also some not so good things coming. And uh, it's about, um, you know, drugs, uh, smuggling of, of drugs and uh, uh, human trafficking and, and all kinds of concerns. And we've been working on um, on these things by using uh, huge data sets. Uh, in the previous presentation, we heard a bit, little bit about AIS, the Automatic Identification System, providing for each, essentially each vessel out on the oceans, um, a data point um, at least uh, every minute, uh, providing us a unique ID, the uh, speed and course of the vessel, and the geographic position, the GPS information. And by analyzing with uh, machine learning methods, machine learning models, such um, data sets, we can automatically detect uh, patterns that point to some kind of uh, possibly suspicious activity. And this is going way beyond what, what humans could do because of the sheer volume of, of the data. Right now, the main focus is on illegal phishing, trying to automatically detect um, activity patterns that point to illegal phishing activities. And we are working in a big project with um, MDA, part of the digital technology supercluster here in the 
you see. Uh, next slide, please. Um, you know, cyber security analytics and, and cyber security in general um, has uh, received a lot of attention uh, recently. And um, the specific focus we have in this field is using essentially the same methods and, and uh, tools to uh, for behavior-based intrusion detection. So we we uh, we are looking at uh, specifically intrusion detection uh, in control uh, supervisory control systems for uh, critical infrastructure like our power grid, transportation systems, communication systems, and so on. Um, and uh, with this new breed of zero-day attacks, um, there is um, uh, no other way than detecting such breaches, security breaches, uh, when they actually made it into the system and changed the behavior of the system in a way that that's a concern. And uh, nowadays we have to use um, AI and machine learning based methods for this because of the short re response time that's required in order to contain a breach before it starts spreading across a, a wider system. Next slide, please. That's already in my last slide. Um, predictive policing is about using, again, the same methods, um, data mining, machine learning, anomaly detection, to analyze uh, massive uh, crime data sets, police reported crimes. We've been working on, um, in collaboration with uh, law enforcement and criminal intelligence agencies in uh, uh, Western Canada and in the East of Canada on especially the analysis of uh, uh, co-offending networks and uh, criminal um, organizations, organized crime, um, studying um, what kind of pattern one can find in these data sets that clearly point to such activities and allow the uh, police then to have a, a global perspective what's going on, which is very difficult to get otherwise because humans cannot, you know, permanently evaluate all the data that's dynamically changing on a daily basis. Um, we have done things like developing algorithms uh, for suspect investigation. It's a little bit like a recommender system works, the, the kind of algorithm you use for Netflix that recommends uh, what kind of movie you want to watch next. Um, this this can be applied um, in, a, in a very similar setting uh, to find the most likely suspect that uh, is linked to uh, a certain uh, crime and uh, or, or produce a ranking of suspects uh, depending on how likely they, they were involved or not. Um, again, these are all fields, um, you know, I'm not saying the problems have been solved. We, we are just stretching the surface, but they all have enormous potential for what we are discussing here today. And I'm um, wrapping up my part and uh, hand it over to Phil. Thank you. So, uh, Uva, thank you so much for the introduction. That was very kind of you. Good afternoon, everyone. Yeah. I had to my remove pleasure. my my virtual background because it was making the video choppy. This is this is my green screen. I'm not actually sitting in my shower. It's my <laughs> pleasure to speak to you today about CSIS's projects and priorities in the context of big data and artificial intelligence. And I'm going to do this also by talking about the challenges we're facing in this data-rich world. And first, I'd like to acknowledge the organizers of this impressive tech summit, the distinguished and very impressive guests who spoke before me today, sponsors and partners of the event, Simon Fraser University, and of course, the co-moderator for the session, Professor Uva Glesser, who I just met uh, virtually, who made some very insightful uh, opening remarks that I could absolutely relate to. I thought I might give uh, you a quick uh, CSIS 101 presentation. I find sometimes people don't know that much about our service, if at all, even in government, and, and I'd like to dispel any notions of us being any kind of secretive, shadowy organization. Can you please slow slide, slide one, please? And while I think it's fair to say that we are a Canada spy agency, the reality is that CSIS is actually Canadians dedicated to protecting Canadians. Slide two, please. So, okay, very quickly, what is CSIS, or rather, who is CSIS? We are a national security intelligence service, and our role is sometimes conflated with what law enforcement might do 
But our work is very different. First of all, it's preventive in nature. So we work to identify threats to Canada's security before they happen. And unlike the police, we have no powers to arrest or detain. So in short, CSIS investigates threats to the security of Canada. We employ over 3,000 Canadians. We have offices across the country and around the world, including in the United States, the United Kingdom, France, and other places, which I can't talk about. Next slide, please. We have a mission statement that says, we are dedicated to the protection of Canada's national security interests and the safety of Canadians. And we can and will chase these threats to Canada's security wherever they are, even around the world if we have to. Our mandate, which is enshrined in legislation of the CSIS Act, includes investigating threats which may on reasonable grounds be suspected of posing a threat to the security of Canada. Like I said, it's preventive. We also have the authority in certain circumstances and with the proper approvals to take reasonable and proportionate measures to reduce threats that we detect. We collect and analyze information, we produce intelligence reports, and we then advise the government about these threats. In doing so, we disseminate a variety of reports and provide formal advice, including threat and security assessments to various departments of the federal government and to law enforcement. Some of these reports are even public and you can visit our website to read more about them. Next slide, please. So this is usually a longer overview of CSIS with more detail, but today I'm not here to uh, deliver a recruitment pitch. And I think we've probably had enough PowerPointing for today. So this is our Twitter account and our website address. This is also my email address. If you want to reach me directly, please don't spam me. Please visit this website, you get more information on there and just take a look at the documents we publish in the public realm. It, it can actually be quite eye-opening. All right, so let's just um, go back to me as a talking head there, please. I talk about threats a lot and for the sake of this discussion today, I'll be focusing primarily on the threats of espionage and foreign interference. But of course, we also prioritize threats of terrorism and extremist violence. There are opportunities and challenges for big data and AI in all kinds of investigations. One way to look at the importance of what CSIS does in confronting the scope of these threats is to understand that terrorism threatens our lives while espionage and foreign interference threatens our way of life. I don't have to tell all of you about the enormous potential that big data and AI hold for shaping and advancing our societies and our daily lives. But I can tell you a little bit about the potential that they hold for intelligence gathering and analysis, and also for the attraction that this sector holds for our adversaries. I hope you'll indulge, indulge me in further contextualizing my remarks today by telling you a little bit about myself and how my journey with the service brought me here today talking about big data and the challenges of the data-rich world. I've had the pleasure of working at CSIS for over 20 years now. I started as an intelligence officer in the, in the late 1990s, and it was a very different time then. My first assignment was on a counterintelligence desk as a case officer, which is a kind of analyst. And indeed, CI is why I had always wanted to join the service. You could say that the Cold War era was still with us, but change was in the air. Already the cool kids in the office were working counterterrorism. Very shortly after that, as a field investigator, I experienced the transition myself from this Cold War era to the era of the war on terror, as the Bush administration called it. Counterterrorism had been growing as a program at CSIS with the rise of groups like Al Qaeda, the Tanzania and Nairobi bombings in 1998 and of course the infamous 9-11 attacks. Everything changed in the early 2000s, and for me, if not for the greater part of the service, it was all terrorism, all the time. I might also suggest it unintentionally obfuscated the arrival of this most recent era, an era that would not necessarily characterize by threat per se, but perhaps by an emerging phenomenon that essentially followed the rise of the internet and the web and the free flow of digital data. I'm talking about the digital data era, the era we live in now, and I might add the era that is uh, that this pandemic is forcing us to contend with, whether we wanted to or not. By 2010, if not before, cyber attacks, and I mean state-sponsored cyber attacks, had become a major concern. In many ways, counterintelligence took back some of its prominence and our service again was forced to adapt to contend with this shift to the digital as a threat vector. And as society also shifted to the digital with consumers spending more time shopping and banking online than they were in the real world and with people meeting and interacting on Facebook rather than at the local coffee shop and with people having access to virtually all of humankind's collected knowledge at their fingertips, 
We saw our own targets of national security investigations also move into this digital space. And this required new ways of investigating threats and the acquisition of new skill sets. There were opportunities, but also new challenges. Commercial, even free encryption became available to everyone. It wasn't something reserved for the military or the spy agencies anymore. And I remember a time when our bad guys would travel long distances to arrange meetings in hard to access places to have a five minute whispered conversation just to evade surveillance, or when aspiring terrorists climbed to remote mountain camps in Afghanistan for indoctrination, communication, training, and planning. Now they have communications apps on their smartphones that are pretty darn secure. So uh, enough with the history lesson, let's talk about what's happening today. We know that foreign actors want Canada's intellectual property and proprietary information to further their own economic, military, and political agendas. These same hostile actors will leverage all elements of their state power, including their intelligence services, to advance their national interest. CSIS has observed persistent and sophisticated state-sponsored threat activity for many years. From coast to coast, some nations are aggressively advancing their own economic, intelligence, and military state interests at our expense. This threat, in my opinion, represents the greatest danger to Canada's national security and can have a tremendous negative impact on our economic growth, on Canadian jobs, and on our ability to innovate and, our, and the preservation of our democratic institutions and our way of life. Our investigations have revealed that cutting-edge Canadian research entities are increasingly targeted by foreign intelligence services. You're aware of the importance of your sector from the perspective of Canadian innovation, technolo technological advancement, and economic growth. It likely won't be difficult for you to appreciate then that the data, the technologies, software products, and knowledge being developed, manufactured, and applied in Canada are hugely valuable targets for our adversaries. The value is not limited to economic and technological advancement. Acquisition will also support the work of our adversaries, intelligence services, and militaries. And let me give you an example of CSIS work in protecting Canada's biopharmaceutical and healthcare industries and businesses. During the pandemic, CSIS stepped out of the shadows to shine a light on the threats targeting this important sector. We leveraged our expertise and footprint in every region of the country and liaised with other government departments, identified entities, businesses, and sectors, including various non-pharmaceutical high-tech sectors involved in Canada's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. That's over 250 entities and hundreds of individuals, by the way. And we worked with these partners to ensure that their work and proprietary information was protected and jobs and economic interests along with it. If you go to our Twitter account, you'll have to scroll back a few weeks, but you can read about how we investigated the threat from foreign interference under what we called the four gates of economic security. These four gates or avenues are used by our adversaries to attempt to acquire Canadian knowledge assets, exports, investments, knowledge transfer, and licensing agreement. They can target you because you possess the information they want, because you have access to the information they want, or because you are in a position of influence. Opening any of the four gates can be facilitated by lack of awareness, of due diligence, or of resilience in our institutions. In order to not unwittingly assist our adversaries in achieving their objectives at our expense, we need to do all we can to protect our institutions and our most valuable assets. At the same time, we recognize and respect that Canadian innovation simply cannot succeed without robust research partnerships, including international collaborations. This means engaging in these collaborations with eyes wide open, ensuring due diligence before entering into partnerships or funding arrangements, and increasing awareness of all those in the community, be it pharmaceutical, high-tech, academia, whatever. So let's talk about big data. Uh, let's talk about big data and AI. There is a lot of open source reporting about China's use of big data and its AI strategy. These reports highlight that China's leadership believes that being at the forefront of AI technology is critical to the future of global military and economic power competition. Similarly, you can find many articles about Russia's use of AI to support its disinformation campaign. I recently had the opportunity to speak at a Ryerson University journalism class about the threat posed by foreign disinformation campaigns in the context of democratic elections. It was a fascinating discussion. As with the other types of dual-use technologies, big data and AI have the potential to be used for peaceful civil applications, but also military and other hostile uses. Consider the various ways that malicious actors could use big data and AI to support cyber attacks, surveillance, disinformation, or weapons development. It's predicted that future progress in AI will be a transformative national security technology on par with nuclear weapons, 
aircrafts, computers, and biotech. And I might add that a new kind of space race, perhaps more commercial at the moment, is also shaping up as an interesting new sector that could transform national security technology. In the Cold War era, when CSIS was founded, espionage activity was typically directed illicit at illicitly obtaining Canadian political, military, and diplomatic secrets, most secured in top-secret government bunkers and military facilities. Today, most big data and AI advances are not happening in these government labs and bunkers, but in the relatively open environments of academia and in the private sector, including in small startups. Unfortunately, private sector, uh, smaller private sector firms in academia pose extremely attractive targets, not only because of the information they hold, but because they are considered soft targets. Academia, because the culture of sharing and openness can be exploited, and startups, because limited resources often means relatively weak security controls and vulnerability to control foreign influence due to their reliance on external fundings or international partnership arrangements. Canadian organizations targeted by foreign adversaries have been the victims of cyber attacks. Their employees or partners have been coerced or in, in, uh, induced into providing valuable information or access. Information has been acquired through covert investment, prospective partnership or funding arrangements, or damaging licensing agreements. The good news is, it means that you're probably doing a really good job at it. If the bad guys weren't interested, I might suggest you need to step it up a little. I can tell you that all this digital era present, uh, this, uh, this digital data era presents some novel opportunities in terms of investigating people based on the trail of digital data left behind. As you know, you can gain incredible insights simply from what we call OSINT or open source intelligence. Things posted online or in the public realm where, the, where there are location and timestamps. Just imagine gaining ads, access to a person's device. Private and public infrastructure also presents some interesting opportunities in terms of data collection, especially with the almost unbelievable connectivity promised by 5G technology. The service has always excelled at human intelligence, or human as we call it, and we continue to do so. We are an all-source intelligence service, and human continues to be a kind of go-to technique. Working with human sources has always presented risks in terms of reliability and difficulty in cooperation, and it can take time to develop. Even the most intrusive measures, the, mo the more covert things an intelligence agency might do, still often rely on things people say. And then even things said in private can be misunderstood, right? The data, however, can be incredibly accurate and reliable if it's properly captured and interpreted. Your device knows things about you that no one else does, even things you're not even aware of yourself. And nowadays, your device is always with you. Your device even interacts with other devices and data nearby or afar. Advances in data generation, storage, and analysis have broadened the capacity of the intelligence work and facilitated a new wave of powerful threat assessments uh, based on increasingly systematic and sophisticated data collection and analysis techniques. Advances in instrumentation and sensors, digital storage and computing, communications, and networks have generated and give access to more and more data. Some 2.5 quintillion bytes of data are produced by humans every day by my own research. It could be more or less, and I'm sure you have your own sources. This deluge of data provides countless opportunities for data mining to extract patterns from data sets in a variety of contexts. For us at CSIS, it means that we have more robust and sophisticated abilities to analyze data in support of our operations, corroborate human and technical sources, to further identify individuals of interest, and to, and to generate leads um, uh, for our investigations. The era of digital data, the data-rich world, has also presented, uh, presented us with some very tough challenges. First, it's a lot more complicated from a technology point of view, but I think you all know this. And second, the volume of data, this deluge of data I talked about earlier, is daunting from a compliance and retention point of view. We can all remember the days when hard drive space was an issue. Now you can find yourself having to sift through terabytes worth of data, and even with the best algorithms and AI, at what point does a human look at it? How much do you give to the human to look at? You know, retention alone is scary. How much can we collect? Who gets access to it? Do they get to see all of it or just parts of it? Is it all important and threat related? Or, and how long do we all keep it for? That's gotten us in trouble in the past. One of my managers breaks down the process and technology. 
I don't dare talk about technology today. I could go in a million different directions on technology. And while I manage a technical branch, I'm not a computer scientist or engineer myself. I could talk about the people, but that's a relatively straightforward one, at least from a common sense perspective. Having the right people with the right skill sets, data exploitation analysts, data scientists, people with a high degree of data literacy are crucial to the success of such an endeavor. We are crossing a threshold at CSIS where I think everybody needs to know about data, and indeed the Government of Canada is driving all its public servants in that direction. This leaves us with process, and process is what I'll touch on next and last. And I'll highlight that one of the most recent developments on this in the, uh, from a CSIS perspective. And when I talk about process, I should really be using the term governance, but sometimes that word gets misinterpreted. Process is simpler and, and more generic, I think. Process is where, they, as they say, the devil is in the details, and process is where it gets complicated. Process speaks to our legislation, our structures, the established practices that are in place to assign authorities, to define decision-making, to deliver, monitor, and report. In the last few years, CSIS has undergone significant legislative changes that have affected the way we acquire, analyze, and store a vast amount of data. The National Security Act of 2017, or Bill C-59 as it was more commonly known, came into force in the summer of 2019 and introduced some of the more significant changes to our act since our organization was created back in 1984. These changes add greater transparency and accountability to our work and modernize our authority in specific areas, including what we call our data set framework. These elements to which big data techniques and AI can be applied. The Act provides a clear legal mandate for CSIS's collection and retention of data sets, including laying out which parameters uh, by which CSIS can collect, retain, and query data sets containing personal information that is not directly and immediately related to a specific threat to national security, but can be useful in helping paint a picture of a threat or trends towards a threat. In this realm of non-threat related data sets, our Act now sets out three, uh, three types of data sets, Canadian data sets, foreign data sets, and publicly available data sets. A Canadian data set is one that predominantly relates to individuals within Canada or Canadians, which includes Canadians, uh, Canadian residents, permanent residents, or Canadian corporations. And while these Canadian data sets are, in my opinion, of greatest value to the investigations, they also require the most laborious processes to acquire from a process perspective, with us having to apply to the federal court to retain it and, of course, to exploit it. Canadian and foreign data sets must remain segregated, and this is done through technology, from operational holdings and can be only queried by designated employees in accordance with the provisions of the CSIS Act. There are also numerous record keeping and audit requirements, and all of this is subject to review by the National Security and Intelligence Review Agency, or NCIRA, the body that replaced CERC. Are you with me on this so far? If, if it sounds complicated, trust me, I've only skimmed the service. This particular process has been widely reported online. Just Google C-59 and datasets if you'd like more information. One peculiarity of this data set framework is that the specific section in our legislation that refers to it, Section 11 of the CSIS Act, is now the longest section of our Act. For contrast, the section that allows us to actually collect in and investigate threats to the security of Canada, which is Section 12, is only about 80 words long, a single paragraph. Even the section that allows us to use federal court warrants to investigate, and this is Section 21 of the CSIS Act, it's about 820 words. And as you can imagine, warrants allow us to perform some of the most intrusive investigative activities there are. Section 11, the section that deals with non-threat related data sets, is over 3,800 words long, is highly prescriptive, and features its own process-oriented safeguards that I think speak to the complexity of working with data sets. So in addition to teams of data exploiters and data scientists that query and exploit these data sets, I also have a strong governance team that helps me stay on track of the acquisition and retention process requirements. As you can imagine, I also have our legal department on speed dial. Are you, so are you guys still with me on this? I'm almost done here. <laughs> Exhausted. Now, of course, Section 11 is just one of the arrows in our quiver. There is still a lot of, that we can do under other sections of our act. These legislative and operational advancements have re resulted in cutting edge intelligence, let me tell you. Everything we do stems from our act. And while we have a part of our act that deals with non-threat related data sets, 
We also have the ability to get warrants from the federal court under Section 21 of the Act, which allow us to, like the police, capture data outside the public realm with the permission of the federal court. And like I said, there is so much data out there. Key federal court decisions have also had a significant impact on our authorities and their limitations, creating tensions between the use of the use of or defense against exponentially more powerful technology in the context of a modern investigation and a statute drafted over 35 years ago. In a data-rich environment, it is essential that we have the authorities to leverage modern tools to support investigations while insurance Canadians pri ensuring Canadians' privacy is protected. In this context, CSIS is working to ensure our authorities are and can continue to be fit for purpose in our dynamic landscape. Notwithstanding these challenges, we at CSIS continue to work with our current legislative authorities to produce innovative intelligence products that are of significant value to our government and partners around the world. We will continue to evolve, hopefully, at pace with technology. I do like to point out that we recognize and respect that Canadian innovation, including ours as a security service, simply cannot succeed without robust partnerships, including international collaborations. And this is why I was glad to present at this tech summit today. So thanks again for your time, and I look forward to our moderated discussion coming up next. Thank you very much, Phil. Uh, Dr. Glasser, I'll leave it to you. I know you have a couple of questions to ask uh, Phil, and I do have some questions from the audience. So I'll come back in about 10 minutes, okay, to, to address those questions. Thank you. Um, um, thank you, Phil, for your Presentation, I think that was very insightful. I, I wasn't aware of that you guys have to deal with so many rules. Um, doesn't make life any easier. I could <laughs> see that. Um, so in, in your presentation, uh, you, you uh, talked about process and, and how important it is and, and what exactly it is. Uh, but you also mentioned that it's uh, very important to have the right people in order to be successful. Maybe you can elaborate a little bit on this. Yeah, I mean, I'd say at CSIS, we have a, a big workforce with a sufficiently high um, level of IT IQ. Um, if, you could, if you could call it that, I think we, we struggle with any, you know, um, from my perspective, it's about bringing the rest of the workforce on board. This other workforce, the more traditional workforce that uh, may not have the same background or maybe the same uh, data literacy knowledge that uh, our, our IT or our, our data science uh, workforce might have. And, and the intelligence business is changing quite rapidly in this environment. I remember reading an article uh, from the Telegraph just a little while back about, I think it was called Spying in the Age of COVID. And the author, it was the, the article was about a novel by um, uh, a novelist, a UK novelist who has contacts at MI6, the British uh, Security Intelligence Service. And um, he, his point was that his contacts were telling him that it was more difficult than ever now to do things in the real world. Well, this has been happening gradually over the past decade now where people in society are, are actually uh, no longer interacting in the real world, world so much. You know, not I mentioned in my presentation, not going to stores as much, not going to coffee shops to talk to each other. Um, so the folks who the folks who would normally have been taking care of that now find themselves, uh, I don't want to say without a job, but certainly um, they need to adapt to this new reality. And so there is a challenge of bringing these people on board and, and, and at, at our organization, nobody gets left behind. So, so we are working uh, very aggressively to, to bring this workforce on board and making them more data literate um, and, and, and working much more collaboratively with our data scientists, with our data exploitation analysts, people who, who know how to work with data and it's a, it's it's a it's partly a, an education piece, and but it's also at the same time a, a way to um, upskill our, our our overall workforce. Mm -hmm. So I do think that the people dimension there is is very important. Of course, we you know we we have a, a perpetual sort of uh, a career opportunity on our external website if people are interested. You know, we call it the technical officer, but it's really the category that's reserved for computer scientists and and engineers. Uh, but I think currently we, all, we also have a data scientist position there. So if anyone's interested, a little plug for our organization. Thank you, Phil. That, that was great. Good answer. Thanks. Um, let me have one more question. Um, um, so I, I know that uh, very recently uh, CSE published um, uh, the National Cyber Threat Assessment 2020. Um, and uh, there it's mentioned, uh, no surprise, that uh, there are state actors 
trying to um, you know interfere with our um, critical infrastructure things in particular our, our electricity grid um, and um, now it, it sounds a bit concerning I, I think people wouldn't want to uh, have a, a huge blackout or so um, so I'm wondering you know um, how would you see big data AI and things like this machine learning could help to uh, build additional resilience against these kind of threats and, and maybe help with situational awareness. Um, how are you taking advantage of this in, in thesis um, to the ex extent you can talk about this? Yeah, thanks. I, I, I do think that AI plays a huge role in the detection of these threats. You know, I think you alluded earlier in your presentation uh, about the s speed at which these can, these threats can yeah. manifest themselves, right? So we're yeah. talking speed, but also volume. Uh, I think, you know, I've, so I've worked extensively with CSE on cyber issues in the past myself. And uh, I know back in the day, you know, this is only maybe a couple of years ago, I think the number was something like 600 million uh, uh, cyber attacks or attempts at intrusions against mm -hmm. Government of Canada computers um, every day. I mean, that's it's yeah. it's an amazing, incredible volume of in the number of potential attacks uh, that need to be detected. So humans can't deal with that that kind of volume or, or the speed of it. So so AI comes in to kind of like help us deal with those two issues. I think, and that's where that's where it comes in. Thank you. Good point. It's it's also um, you know just to elaborate a little bit on on this. Um, you know, for the longest time, we were hoping if, if we only put up enough firewalls and what else it takes, uh, a breach will never happen. This is not a valid assumption anymore. So the assumption should be give it some time and the breach will happen no matter what we do in order to, you know, build a strong security uh, perimeter around our, our IT infrastructure. So yeah, when it yeah. happens, when it comes down to, um, you know, contain the breach, and this is where time becomes a very critical. So it's, it's a question of, of an hour and something on average before such a breach to any bigger system, especially these control, supervisory control systems that I mentioned, running in the background, monitoring our services for us. Um, before it spreads across such a system, and, and then the damage will be so much worse. Um, and, you know, on the attacker side, they start now more and more using AI, and the only thing that can really beat AI is AI, so we have to use AI yeah. on the defender side. And it's a yeah. bit like a dance between attackers and defenders, but time is getting more and more critical. Yeah, it's a fantastic point. I think, you know, you talked about just putting up firewalls as the kind of like, you know, put it up and then you can leave it. And, you know, yeah. it's kind of like assuming that the, the threat landscape won't change, that the the adversaries, you know, it could be, you know, for the most part, you know, it's not always like big, bad state actors who are doing it. Um, some, most of it is probably criminal in nature and, 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 but it's constantly evolving. You know, the, the bad guys, if I can generalize and use that term, the bad guys are constantly adapting and constantly coming up with new creative ways to get around those firewalls. So we, we, you, we just can't afford to be complacent. And, and yeah, like you said, if they started using AI to do it, it's a game changer for the bad guys. So we also need to change yeah. our game. Plus it's a very unfair game because the attackers, they have to be only lucky ones and defenders have to uh, protect against all possibilities all the time. So, um, yeah. Um, maybe I can ask another quick question, uh, something I'm, I'm personally very interested in as well. Um, of course, in, in Canada, um, privacy is a very high, has a very high value and we are happy it is like this. Um, but on the other hand, uh, when working in the field of big data um, and doing machine learning, um, what we need to uh, work in, in on real world problems is uh, data from the real world. And this is where it gets tricky because then, you know, there is the desire to improve our security, 
But on the other hand, we are also limited by privacy concerns in sharing this data widely. And even if it's just shared with uh, researchers in, in an academic research environment, uh, it can be very tricky. And I've done this in the past quite a, quite a bit, but it's, um, it's not easy to do it. And, and, uh, how would you see this? Is there a way of, of, you know, getting it both ways? We improve our security and we protect our privacy. Um, and still we allow researchers to analyze some data. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, I think it's very difficult. You know, uh, I think it's something the government of Canada very broadly struggles with because, you know, like you were not the only folks who work with data to, to, to solve yeah. problems. Um, uh, other like, um, you know, some of my colleagues at, um, my colleagues at Statistics Canada, for example, have very mm -hmm. advanced data programs and, and they work with, you know, they work with real data collected, uh, by Canadians who Canadians who yeah. sort of like, you know, uh, in many ways voluntarily give up this information, uh, or, or it's collected by, you know, for different means through surveys and things like that very legitimately, right? Um, it, it, the, you know, uh, uh, we, we, as a service, we also, we, we have, we leverage our own authorities to, to capture some of this data. But you're right, like, particularly in the development of new AI for us, for example, like we, you know, I think, I mean, I can't speak for all of my, my, my data scientists and my developers, but they do work with a lot of dummy data just to kind of like get the applications up and running. Um, I, I do think that it, this is an advantage for our adversaries where, you know, certain countries that I wouldn't mention, um, have the ability to use real data in real time to develop and test their AI and algorithms. And mm -hmm. it doesn't matter, you know, where the information come from. It's, uh, it's not necessarily an issue for them. It would certainly be a, a huge challenge for a country like Canada, where, you know, the rule of law is, is, is top concern and, you know, there's, there's no way around it. Um, yeah. Yeah, like I can't speak for how it's, it's going in academia, but I would imagine we face some similar issues. I see. Let me maybe mention one uh, of, of uh, the examples that, that we went through. We were working uh, on, with a real uh, um, police reported crime data set for the province of BC um, in a project that was initiated by Public Safety Canada, the organized crime division, and we were looking for uh, organized crime patterns in the in the police data. Um, in order to make that work, you know, we we had to place the data that we got from the uh, RCMP in this case um, in a data center um, that's uh, you know at our university main campus in Burnaby, sitting two levels underground. It's a bunker style building, you know, all concrete walls, and then the servers that we used to store the data were still protected in this with a steel cage that was mounted to the floor and to the ceiling and you need biometrics to actually enter this and so on and so on. Um, you know, I needed uh, security clearance for myself and my students to work on this. <laughs> yes, in the end, it's extremely interesting and, and uh, rewarding, but it takes a while to get this research going and uh, so, yeah. Maybe yeah, I, symp I sympathize, you know, I, I sympathize <laughs> because that's my everyday, this is okay. every day for me, right? <laughs> okay. Yeah, well, um, let's, let's hear if uh, Kevin has uh, any, any questions from the audience you would like to share with us. Okay. Yeah, I, I do have a couple here, guys. You, you, you actually covered a couple of them as you were discussing them. I'm, I mean, I could listen to you guys chat the entire night here. Um, uh, the one that I saw here has to do with um, the pandemic and everyone working from home. How, I mean, this, this question can be posed to both of you guys, to be honest. How do you see, like with everyone working from home, the attack service has increased for small and medium-sized companies in Canada who might not, not, not necessarily have the resources to immediately augment their cybersecurity in parallel with working. How do you see, what kind of advice would you give a small and medium-sized company in Canada, perhaps a more digital-focused one, uh, in terms of how to protect themselves in this new environment, like maybe a Phil, like, or from your observations or your team's observations, has that has the fact that they're all working from home actually increased the risk to small and medium-sized companies or the attacks on them? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say it has. I, I can't speak in terms of specifics or even tangibles right now because I think 
you know, not enough time has passed to, to, to give you a proper assessment of the, the sort of volume of, of how much it might have increased, but definitely the potential for it is definitely there, right? Um, I think people, we talked about it in my presentation where some of the smaller startups, for example, are much more vulnerable about it because like you said, like they, they don't have the money to invest in proper security or sufficient security. Um, so some of the things that they can do, for example, is actually reach out to two, two agencies like ours. Um, you know, we, we have information on our website about resources on how uh, some of the smaller enterprises can, can protect themselves. Uh, we, we have started a very aggressive outreach campaign over the summer. Uh, despite the pandemic and in, in, in talking to to two conferences like this one, but also to to um, you know chambers of commerce and um, and uh, other other places where small businesses might uh, reach out to for information so that we are as as much as possible to try to make sure that we cover uh, a, as broad a territory as possible. But I would say, yeah, it is a challenge. Uh, Uva, I, I don't know if you might have any insight on that. Oh, yeah. Um, well, um let me first cite the um, 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 national threat, cyber threat assessment. Um, it, they came to the conclusion that, um, you know, these breaches that they happen, the really bad ones, um, you know, wh where a company uh, proprietary networks um, get uh, compromised because they are connected to the internet. Um, these breaches often go unnoticed on, on average, actually, close to 200 days. About 200 days, the bad guys hang on to the system and no one knows. And even once they are detected, it takes about, uh, on average, I think it's uh, like 60-something, uh, what was it? It was about uh, 60 something days, yeah, 65 days or so to clean this up. You know, once the breach has spread all through the network, that, that's not an easy way to fix. Oh, in, in the current situation, I mean, it, it, it was already really in, in a way bad before because we all have the tendency to use the same devices for working uh, from home or even at the workplace, uh, like our phones, like our, our laptops and so on. Um, and there is, of course, this, this uh, compromises security. That, that's not a question. Um, but, but nowadays, this has become the new, has become the new normal. So I'm using my phone for my work, my, uh, all day long. I'm using my laptop for work all day long. But I also do, you know, financial transactions on the same laptop. And so, um, clearly the, the, um, attack surface has increased exponentially. And it also increases with the time we spend in cyberspace, uh, you know, performing all kinds of transactions, collaborations. Um, so simply because the, the chances for attackers to be successful and, and think about ransomware, where they uh, try to reach as many people as possible. Um, this is heaven right now uh, for them, and it's very difficult for us to protect against this. So I think uh, a main point is to be absolutely aware of the risks that we are facing, and often, often it doesn't take much. You just have to be a little smarter than the rest of us in protecting yourself, because they go after the lowest hanging fruits and um yeah and they they also do it from the security of their own home right they, there's a lot less jeopardy <laughs> in cyber crime now than there used to be in real crime it it has become so much more convenient <laughs> we need yeah. guns anymore um uh only like on the like small medium sized business and Phil you mentioned you know CSIS and CSE offer resources to uh, small, medium-sized companies with advice and whatnot. And like, well, that advice is very simple. You know, like don't click links, and know who it's coming from. Like, is it really, is it really like that simple to protect uh, their, you know, networks? Does it come down to those nitty gritty details? Or like if like one of those, you know, those, one of those uh, nations of, you know, thou shall not be named, uh, really want to get into a network, like, is there anything that like you can really do to stop them? You know, is it, or does it really just come down to those, those simple hygiene things? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a combination of all of the above. I think, I think, you know, when it comes to 
state sponsored cyber attacks like you are you you know you are, the sophistication of these kinds of attacks are no match for your sort of average small business if, if you know if that's a concern perhaps uh but i i don't th you know i wouldn't go as far as to say that's your biggest threat you know i think your biggest threat from a from a small to medium business enterprise kind of perspective is is probably the criminal stuff the stuff that you deal you might deal with on a personal basis every day so if you do sort of like you know um keep your security protocols up you know for the most part you should be fine but you know, i mean there's always a risk right like i think as, as uva said it's a lot of times it's the low hanging fruit uh, it's also targets of opportunity. So people, you know, don't, you know, the, the cyber criminals don't go after the, 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 the places where they know the networks will be more secured. Um, but it's hard to say. It's so hard to say now because the business is, is um, so much of business is now online as opposed to being brick and mortar, right? Uh, you know, the, the product that you sell doesn't reside in your living room. It, it's hosted on a server somewhere and it, you know, how secure are those you know, those cloud servers, I don't know, like I imagine for the most part, they're very secure, but uh, certainly the, the, the opportunities are, are, are slightly different here. We're talking about um, a world now where um, the transactions are happening so quickly um, and people depend on the technology. They, they depend on the fact that they've been told that it's secure. So how, how can you be sure you can trust that? Um, you know, there's no easy way other than through, through trial and error and reputation and things like that, right? I don't know if you have Absolutely. a different perspective. I, I completely <laughs> agree to everything you, you just said. And, and I think um, it, what's very important is to uh, be more cyber risk aware and, and do the at least the bare minimum, right? So use a proper antivirus software. Um, use proper passwords and the password word management uh, application. And um, don't use the same password for all kinds of different things. And it's these things that go such a long way. If, if one does this, one is already so much better off and, and raises the bar for attackers to actually breach the security. But most important of all is don't assume for some funny reason, it's always hitting the others. <laughs> uh, yeah. we, you know, we have to live with the inconvenient truth that it will eventually hit us. And, and then it comes down to how prepared are we in order to mitigate the impact and, and contain the damage, um, you know, having proper backups of our software to protect against ransomware and so on. Um, but it's an extra offer, effort we, we all have to accept in our daily working life to follow the rules, to follow you know, reasonable procedures and avoid the, the the most stupid mistakes. Yeah, and, and I also add like we're so we're so coupled in this modern globalized society that you know uh, a, a data breach which is not our fault. Like my you know if my there's a data breach at my bank, it's not my fault. But all of a sudden, somebody else has all of my personal information, and they could use that information to you know, not not necessarily just go after me directly, but go after the list of clients yeah. that was breached on the bank. So a lot of times this stuff is completely out of our control. You know, just recently I was uh, going using my Chrome browser and I was, I saw that it was alerting me to the fact that some of my stored passwords and the, uh, the you know, the, the the ones that I use for my everyday low level stuff had been uh, found in a, in a in my, you know, my email address had been found in a data breach somewhere. Oh my God. So I had to change all these passwords, you know? So it's, this is, you know, I think the companies are getting better at also um, creating awareness of the problem. But like I said, it's, it's just a shifting landscape, like nonstop. Maybe just got, one comment on, sorry, on this. Uh, yeah. um, you know, most of the breaches in the range of 95% or so intrusions into a company's network start still with opening a Word document from someone people don't know or clicking on that link that sounds so promising, don't do it, never ever. Okay. Yeah, I wish I wish I could uh, wrap up with that one, but I got one more one more for you guys. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Um, has to do with uh, disinformation. We talked a little bit about that uh, earlier, and I mean on Twitter, Facebook. 
real and who's not real, or if people are spreading misinformation. I mean, obviously they are spreading misinformation on purpose. And uh, Phil um, and UV, UV, I mean, please chime in as well. Uh, like, what do you, what do you think are the best? How do you combat that? Just the massive amount of disinformation out there right now that's just prevalent in society nowadays. I mean, is that a responsibility of like the Twitters of the world to you know start censoring? Uh, people more, you know, or is or is that a government responsibility, or uh, where do you? I don't want to ask you for a solution here, but like, how do you? Uh, who, whose responsibility should it reside on primarily in your? Yeah, thanks for asking me for to not find a solution to it because it's a, <laughs> a very widespread problem. Um, uh, you know, like I talked about how our in our Twitter account that sees us, there's that. If you go back a few weeks, we talked about how we were protecting, you know, businesses and 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 for the pharmaceutical industry during the COVID summer. Um, there's also some tweets um, uh, over the summer about misinformation and disinformation, and I think it was part of our public report uh, this summer. It came out. We talked a little bit about that, the difference between the two, and you know, uh, some of the things that could be done about it. It's definitely a very difficult question because you you're you know you're immediately thrust into this world of like you know free speech and, um, you know, uh, di di differences of opinion and things like that. I think that, you know, I think it's fair to say that some disinformation, uh, if it can be detected coming from really, you know, some some bad state actors or even criminals who put it out there to do things like disrupt uh, or to, to um, you know, to purposely spread incorrect, wrong information in, in order to um, affect change in society, I think, those are the kind of kinds of people that need to be investigated, and maybe there is a role to play by 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 the Facebooks and Twitters of the world. Um, but it's a very difficult question because you know, for us as a, an intelligence agency, we we provide advice to government, so it's it's hard for us to say you know you know let's shut down these accounts because these, these we know these are bad guys. Um, you know, we 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 need to be to tread carefully in those areas. Uh, but definitely, like if I, yeah, we th these are things that we have been able to detect, and and there is a lot of it out there. Yeah, good point. Uh, I would like to add uh, one thought uh, because we are talking about tweets. Um, a very common threat now is that um, botnets are widely used um, to spread tweets, and it makes it appear like it's real people sending them. It's probably not easy to attack, not even with AI or um, other big data um, um, methods. And um, I, I think the, the most uh, important uh, way to protect against this is critical thinking. So be careful, don't believe everything someone tweets just because it, it's on uh, coming as a tweet. These botnets, uh, just to give an idea, is um, like Mirai is one of the most powerful botnets we know. It can easily recruit 300,000 and more uh, little devices. Often it's these little IoT devices that we are using in our home environment uh, for, you know, um, controlling our lights or so. These are tiny little toys, but uh, this is enough to, when they are recruited uh, by by a botnet, uh, that they start sending out, because they are often typically connected to the internet, sending out tweets then. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's no easy way to escape from this. Yeah, I notice this Thank all you, the time. Yeah. You, can almost, you, you can almost point them, I mean, you can definitely find them online all the time, especially under particular politicians' tweets, you can fix, see the ones that are clearly <laughs> bots. I'll leave it at that. Okay, well, uh, we're 11 minutes over, but uh, man, oh man, what a what a great way to wrap up the Canadian GovTech Summit. That's and man, oh, that was that was awesome. A lot of rich content. Uh, so thank you very much, Phil. Real pleasure to hear the organization. Last year, thank you very much for representing uh, Simon Fraser University. You brought a incredibly uh, un unique but expert perspective on this. So really appreciate your participation. I want to thank uh, Simon Fraser University and the University of Ottawa Social Development Institute for being our partners for these events. Um, of, cor of course, think on uh, as the B2B to go sponsor, NetApp as the keynote sponsor for this summit. And of course, all the public sector folks that really stepped up and volunteered their time uh, to participate. It's been an incredibly challenging uh, year for all of us, um, particularly all of those that had to 
work from home so suddenly, right? So, you know, these kinds of summits could not have happened without their participation. Thank you for everyone for the time they put into it. And of course, the audience uh, for tuning in. So I will, uh, as soon as I get these videos edited and approved by all the stakeholders, I'll, I'll post the ones I get, I get approved to the YouTube channel as, uh, as promised. But uh, I hope you guys, everyone has a great, uh, uh, well-deserved holiday uh, with lots of uh, time with family and friends, well, family, let's leave it, everyone in their own households. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, wishing uh, everyone, you know, a great, uh, great end of the year. Uh, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Phil, and thanks to Kelly. Take care. Yes, absolutely. Take care. Bye. Good night.